This is Bible Academy. <clears throat> I'm Pastor Teacher Curtis Omo. Today we continue our study in the book of Galatians. But before we get started, let's make sure that we have confessed our sins, that we are controlled in the Spirit of God. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you again for the privilege and the opportunity to study your word. We ask that we'll have open hearts and minds to your truth today. In Jesus' name, amen. We are in Galatians chapter 3, beginning verse 1. Before we move on into the third chapter, <clears throat> Sometimes we lose track of the, of the overall purpose of an epistle when we spend so much time looking at the details. We do not want to lose the flow of the passage of what Paul is trying to say, the points he tried to say at the beginning. And then as he moves in to his arguments as we go through these different chapters. So we need to remember <clears throat> what we have seen in this epistle so far. One of my old professors used to say, you read through the epistle like two or three times before you even begin to exegete it. See, that way you get an idea of what is going on and where the epistle is going as you look at the verses individually. That's not a bad piece of advice at all. Let's go back and try to recall what we have learned so far. Remember that at the beginning of the epistle, Paul opened up with several comments about the Galatian Christians on the issue of them deserting God and turning to a false gospel. Very strong statements at the beginning of an epistle. So this epistle starts out with a different tone. We might say a little bit of a scolding tone, but something very seriously is going wrong with the Galatian Christians. Then Paul goes on to describe how he received his revelation from Jesus Christ. Apparently there were those who were accusing Paul of not only his legitimacy as an apostle, but also his message. This is often the case when someone does not like what a Bible teacher is teaching, they will go after him personally in some manner. He's not qualified, he doesn't really belong up there, uh, he doesn't have the right uh, image that we want as a pastor, and then they don't really care that much about what he's saying, uh, except when they're offended. Well, Paul goes on to continue to describe how he received his revelation from Jesus Christ, that he was chosen to be an apostle, and his mission was to the Gentiles. He wrote how he had little contact with the apostles for over a decade. He wrote of the false brethren who were coming into the assemblies, spying out the freedoms that the Christians were having in Christ while not living under the law. Then he tells the Galatians of his face-to-face -face confrontation with Peter over his dereliction of the gospel of grace when he withdrew from Gentile Christians in the city of Antioch when he saw some of his old Jewish perhaps friends, old buddies, come in. He didn't want to offend them or the word get back to Jerusalem that he was having open fellowship with the Gentiles, not following all the traditions and customs that the Judaizers or legalists would normally have among the Gentile Christians. It's something that 
perhaps we can only relate to in our day when it comes to something racially or major uh, economic differences or social statuses that we don't associate with certain people or people won't associate from us or with us. But he cites these examples, these stories to the Galatians to teach them how even Peter was wrong in the way he did this. And citing this important incident regarding Jewish believers, including the leaders, getting knocked off a tr getting knocked off track, he shows the Galatians how serious it was. How this has a contagious effect. A contagious effect with other believers around them, as it happened at Antioch. Legalism is devastating. It is harmful. It is something you do not want to get started in your church assembly, in your own life. And yet it's very common and often prevalent among many Christian denominations. And as we see in this passage, much of that is based upon the operation of the flesh, that is, the sin nature. The sin nature takes pride in doing its own works and attempting to say that this pleases God when in fact nothing in the flesh pleases God. Paul continues in the epistle giving a few short sentences, brief sentences, on them trying to return to the law. He follows this by some personal words about his own union with Christ and Christ living in him. Then we spent some time, some entire session on the importance of the union with Christ that we as believers have. Now in chapter 3, Paul turns to the Galatians and cites their own experiences with grace. Now don't lose track of the overall argument here. Is that the Galatians had gotten away from the gospel, had gotten away from the teachings of the new covenant, uh, the teachings of grace, and in their own lives, they were falling back into some very harmful patterns that Judaizers, now Judaizers are those who not only believed in the Mosaic Law, it just depended on the group. Some wanted to continue the Mosaic Law and many of the customs. Others would add so many of the traditions and oral interpretations, such as Paul had when he was a leading rabbi among the Pharisees. So we have these people come in to these Christian assemblies, start to throw their weight around, their tradition around, and uh, it's kind of like fighting City Hall. It's very difficult when you see hundreds of years of traditions being set aside. The old timers come in and say, we shouldn't be doing that. And for you young upstarts, you new Christians, to say that that's no longer part of following God. Uh, there's been some major changes. We can just see the challenges that new believers often have. And that's true today, too. Today is from legalism. It's from emotionalism. Uh, not to mention all the groups with their subtle false teachings that mislead Christians. So Paul is going to the Galatians. He cited his experience, he cited what happened with Peter, and now he's going to go to the Galatians themselves. Now Paul is going to use some very strong terms here. Uh, these are terms that you wouldn't hear in pulpits today, except perhaps quoting this passage because it's too offensive, it's too aggressive. Listen to what he starts out with in chapter 3, verse 1. O oh, you foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? 
before whose very eyes Jesus Christ was portrayed as crucified. Well, let's look at some of the words here before we look at the interpretation. You see the word O, that's an interjection. It expresses emotion. It's just the simple letter Omega. That's the capital there, capital form. You see at first it looks like a horseshoe. All right. It's a long O pronunciation. O. Then he calls them foolish. An interesting word, not the one you often see in Scripture. Anoetos. It means not understanding, unwise, foolish, as we translated, dull-witted. Now, I'm on the verge of using the term stupid, but that has too many other connotations. But some of that is in the definition here. They're not putting together. Thoughts is the idea behind it. Listen to Titus 3.3. 3. As Paul describes the condition of the unbeliever. At one time we too were foolish, disobedient, deceived, and enslaved by all kinds of passions and pleasures. We lived in malice and envy, being hated and hating one another. That word for foolish is the same that we have in our passage. Then he says, Who has bewitched you? Another interesting word. Boskino, literally, it means bewitched by black magic. It's metaphorical to be led away into evil by deception and influence. Now this is not to say that there is certainly evil involved in this movement that was beginning to uh, cloud over the thinking of the Galatians. But we need to get the idea of what Paul is saying. You're foolish. It's as if someone has cast a spell on you so you're not even thinking clearly. You're not even yourselves. So that's how he begins to address them in about the center portion of this epistle. Then he lays out something that is very has been made very clear to them when he says, Before whose very eyes Jesus Christ was portrayed Errors passive indicative. Prographo. You see the word graphics or grapho in there. To portray publicly. To proclaim. It's like you um, paste a large poster out on a public bulletin board. It has been made very clear. All right, and what's been made clear? Jesus Christ was portrayed as crucified. Perfect tense. The perfect tense of starao means crucify. The perfect tense means it's completed action. The action's over with. And we're emphasizing the results, in this case, the continuing results. So Paul, in this first verse, in fact, the first two verses, says three things to the Galatians. They're rather startling, they're rather derogatory, and they are critical. He's about to lose these guys. They're about to move over lock, stock, and barrel completely into legalism. 
Let's look at this a little closer. He first, the first thing he says is, Oh, you foolish Galatians. He's addressing them rather strongly with a lot of emotion. And here's the idea behind it. This makes no sense. This makes no sense what you people are doing. Now, let me talk about this word fool again for a moment. As I said earlier, it's not the same that we often see used, uh, like Christ used in the Gospels. In that case, in, those, in, that, in that term uh, that Christ often used, it has the idea of having no spiritual discernment. All right? That's more in the spiritual realm. This term fool here is a person who doesn't use his physical senses. He's not very smart. He does not see what is in front of his eyes. He does not hear what is clearly stated. It's like you're blind to something right in front of you. You can't think. You can't put two and two together. In this context, in this context, it's adding works to grace. Can't you see what you're doing? Can't you see that when you add to grace, it's no longer grace? You know, and, and, I, and when I say that myself, I think about how many people I know have been saved by grace, but they want to live by the power of the flesh. My opinion is that most Christians live by the power of the flesh. And I say that because many Christians I've talked to and my experience in the churches I have pastored over the years, they don't get it. And they never get it. They're never controlled by the Spirit long enough to understand the true teachings of the Scripture and they stay caught up in the flesh all their lives. And I also speak from my own experience. I've been in uh, churches for years and never heard it taught. The importance of being controlled by the Spirit, of confessing your sins. And yet that is a fundamental act of the believer daily. You can't be a student of Scripture and see that Christians did not regularly confess their sins. And under the New Covenant, since we have the Holy Spirit indwelling us, living by the power of, Spirit, living by the, power of the Spirit is essential to do God's will, to study the Word, to follow His lead, to restrain us from sin to convict us of what we're going to do is wrong. Paul goes on the next line. Who has bewitched you? It's as if someone has captured their mind. And this is the way it is when people do not walk in the Spirit. When they're not controlled by the Spirit they easily fall under the influence of false teaching, of evil, and certainly under the control of their own sin nature. And it doesn't take long, especially with your, with, if you're within a group who has a mindset for the flesh and legalism to you, for you to be caught up into their thinking and to their habits. The idea behind this is that someone has so influenced them they're not thinking for themselves. And we've probably all known of those situations in our lifetime where people weren't thinking for themselves or going along with the herd, going along with the crowd. But this is, what well, I like to use the word, this is befuddling. The Galatian Christians who Paul had spent time with and taught have reverted back to something that he actually 
did away with in his life. We see how they have been bewitched. When he says, before whose very eyes Jesus Christ was portrayed as crucified, Paul and his team had so painted a clear picture of who Christ was and what Christ did. It's as if they had a huge poster in their living room, in their bedrooms, in their dining rooms of Christ on the cross, and now they refuse to acknowledge it. Paul says he's painted a clear picture of Christ and his crucifixion to them. They've had the gospel handed to them. So they not only understood it, but accepted it, believed it. And now they're turning away. They're tearing down the posters. Verse 2. Paul continues this rather rough tone with the Galatians. I would like to learn one thing from you. Did you receive the Spirit by works of the law or by the hearing of faith? Now, here someone talked to us in that tone, in that manner, in those words. We know this is a confrontation. The implication is that Paul knows the Galatians understand exactly what he's asking them. They know the answer to this question. He wants them to say it. Are they going to deny this? What has been an obvious truth in their lives? You see how Paul gets to the quick of the matter? He used what we say around here. He doesn't mess around. Paul goes to one of the main new realities in their lives that's been in their life, that is still there, but now they're beginning to ignore it. A most basic truth when they became believers. How all this started. Did you receive the Spirit by works of the law or by the hearing of faith? Let's talk about that phrase, hearing of faith. That sounds a little different than what we're used to. But that is the literal translation here. We'll see it later also in verse 5. Both salvation and spiritual growth come through hearing of faith. This is a way of saying, believing, using your faith when you hear the truth. The hearing of faith is hearing the truth and believing it in faith. Repeat that. The hearing of faith is hearing the truth and believing it with faith or in faith. One of the fundamental truths of the Christian life, and I use the word fundamental, I mean very basic. Something you learn as a first grade Christian is that all believers become saved and then grow through the hearing of faith. You exercise your faith when you hear the gospel, when you hear God's word. We hear the gospel, we are saved through faith. We hear the word of God taught and believe it, we grow spiritually. Romans 10, 17, so faith comes from hearing and hearing through the word of Christ. Now, let me bar Paul's tone for a moment. How do you expect to grow in the Christian life without seriously studying God's word every day? I bet there are a number of things that you do every day that you would not do without, like eat, 
the habits that we have every day, one of those should be studying God's Word. And I don't mean a five-minute devotional. I will say that's better than nothing. And if you're on the move, I know in times when I was in the service, when we were out in the field, uh, it was hard to find five minutes. But that was a rare exception. Most of us have plenty of time to find time to study the God's Word. And what you do is make it a priority. But do you expect to grow as a Christian without studying God's Word? Seriously? You won't. You're not designed that way. Why do you think we have the Word of God? Hundreds of pages of thousands of teachings that we learn to live by. And not legalistically, but through the power of the Spirit. We have it handed to us. It has been, been preserved over the generations, over the centuries. And we still have the Spirit in us just as much as they did on the day of Pentecost. So faith comes from hearing and hearing through the Word of Christ. You want to build your faith? You want to grow in your faith? As people say, well, I just don't have enough faith. Well, maybe you need to study the Word of God and the power of the Spirit, and your faith will grow. And you will be tested. And you won't have to use that excuse anymore. What I'm saying is this. Both our faith and spiritual maturity depends upon us exposing ourselves to God's Word on a regular basis. It may be 30 minutes here, an hour there, an hour and a half to two hours there. Far more important than that ball game Now listen, I'm going to expand on this a little bit. Your spiritual growth to maturity does not come by standing around clapping your hands to the beat of a drum in what some call a worship service. What that, what that does is often raise your emotions, make you think you're getting closer to God. That's what's behind much of the charismatic movement. Unfortunately, that's moved into many of our mainline denominations and perpetuated that type of thinking. It's moved away from legalism to emotionalism, and many churches have the mixture of both now. You cannot apply feelings and emotions to situations in your life. You apply the Word of God. This is not to say we don't have feelings and emotions. Of course we do, and in worship services. But those feelings and emotions are responding to the truth that you have in your heart and in your mind, not just the music, not just clapping along and waving your hands like everybody else. Your worship is a response to God speaking to you His Word. And you reverently and you humbly come before Him to hear His Word because He has something to say to you. And in your heart you're saying, Lord, I'm here to listen. I'm here to obey. I'm here to learn. I'm here to follow Jesus. If you were alive during the time of Jesus and he was in your neighborhood, I would assume that you would go see him. I don't think you'd go see him and he would not be standing around leading the type of worship services that we often see in our churches today. You would go to him to hear the truth. You want guidance. Lord, what do you want me to do? How do you want me to live? What do you want me to do with my life? 
you see. So what I'm saying is, faith comes from hearing and hearing through the word of Christ. Now, let's go back to the question that Paul raises. Let me put it on the board. Did you receive the Spirit out of works of the law or the hearing of faith? In other words, how did you get the Spirit? So you can just see them standing there saying, let me think here, how did I get the Spirit? Uh, no, they knew how they got the Spirit. Paul gives them multiple choice answers. Works of the law? Or hearing of faith? Was it by faith or during the works of the law that you received the Spirit? And you have to think, how could they get so far off something so simple and straightforward? The obvious answer is the Spirit came by faith. When you believed in Jesus Christ, when you trusted in Him as your Lord and Savior, when you put your entire spiritual welfare into His care and committed yourself to Him, you received the Spirit. That's part of the package of being a Christian. Now, with the obvious answer being, I received it by faith. I began this whole Christian endeavor by faith and then receiving the Spirit at that moment. We move on to verse 3. Are you so foolish? There he goes again. Having begun by the Spirit, are you now trying to finish by the flesh? Paul says, are you, that's the plural, plural of you. Are you so foolish? There's the word again. Same word we saw earlier back in verse 1. Are you so blind and deaf? You can't think, you can't see, you can't hear, you can't put two thoughts together. Well, this is getting kind of insulting, isn't it? That having begun by the Spirit, which you just sort of admitted to, and now you're trying to continue to grow by the flesh? What does Paul mean by that, by the flesh? Well, if you've been in my studies very long, you know. They're trying to do it without the Spirit. They're trying to live the Christian life without the Spirit. And let me tell you, you can't live the Christian life without the Spirit. The next question, he says, having begun, aorist, middle, participle. Enarchomai, to begin, to make a beginning. It's in the aorist tense, usually translated as a past. Here it's a participle. Having begun, are you now trying to finish by the flesh? The word for finish, epitalao, to bring to an end, finish, complete. Metaphorically, by the way, when you see that meta, that means metaphorical. Are you trying to go to spiritual maturity in the flesh? Now, if you have very much truth in your heart, if you've learned the word very much, if you've stayed with this ministry very long, if you've studied ichthus very long, you know that that's just silly. My words. You can't even begin to grow spiritually. In the flesh. In fact, you go the other direction. So Paul's simple question, having begun by the Spirit, 
Are you now trying to finish by the flesh? The obvious answer is, of course you begun by the Spirit. Why are you, why would you even think you could grow in the flesh? And that's what legalism is. The flesh here is man's efforts. Man's work. Man's works of the law. It's man's works, that would include the law, man's efforts, man's power. Let's use that word, man's power. The spirit The Holy Spirit is God's power, God's working through you. Sometimes when I go through these lessons, I don't always think about them when I review my text that I'm going to teach you, but things come to mind that seem so relevant. Time is getting short, folks. We need to be ready for the big events that's probably going to happen in the next decade or so. Things are certainly changing in different parts of the world right now. You'd have to be foolish not to see it. For one to fall back on the flesh and think he's going to get anywhere in this Christian life is extremely foolish. Two big movements today are within Christianity. The emotionalism portrayed in the charismatic movement has flowed over into the mainline denominations and the works of the flesh. The emotionalism used to be in just a small group. Up until the 70s it started to spread out and now it's rampant everywhere. The legalism has always been around. Emotionalism, emotionalism has come and gone, usually within smaller groups, but now it's prevalent over a lot of Christian uh, groups. And the spirit is often ignored, or they redefine the spirit and tie it in somehow to the emotionalism. The flesh, including the emotion, this is where the emotion stems from, man's body, man's flesh. When one decides that he's going to live by the flesh, live by emotionalism, live by legalism, he rules out God's power in his life. But you can't have both. Paul laid this out clearly in the next couple of chapters. He will lay it out very clearly for us. God's power is God dependent. We depend upon the Spirit of God. We are depending upon God. And that's what we're supposed to do. I will say this again, and I'll say it a lot of times, and it still won't get through to some people. You cannot live the Christian life on your own. You're not designed to. That's why God gave you His Spirit. And if you are not utilizing His power... Now, let me just say this. If you don't know what I'm talking about, you need to go back and look at some of the basics. You may even be trying to understand this in the power of the flesh. It's confusing, you'll reject it, you don't want to hear it. It doesn't make sense. So you turn off and never you turn off the video and never hear this again. You prefer to live by the flesh. Or you prefer, oh I like my emotionalism. See, Paul is going to the heart of the Galatians right now because they have bought into the flesh and the legalism. What's he call them? Foolish. He's reasoning this 
through with them. Are you now trying to finish by the flesh? You start out in the spirit. Are you trying to finish by the flesh? You've you've changed your you've changed horses here. You've went from riding a race horse towards maturity to hopping on a donkey going backwards. Too many westerns. Verse four question. The question verse four becomes more general in nature. Let's look at what he says. Galatians chapter 3, verse 4. Have you experienced so much for nothing, if indeed it was for nothing? Let's talk about this word experience. In many of your translations will use the word suffer. The word is Pasco. The basic definition of Pasco is to experience. It can be good or bad experiences. In the scripture, we usually see it in the sense of suffering. I'm not sure the percentage. I would say, just to guess, 90% of the time it has to do with suffering. So people often uh, translate it as suffer, especially when they see it in the context of I'm not so sure that's what Paul's talking about, their suffering. It may be. But if I use the word experience, that includes suffering. But it also includes their good experiences too. So I prefer the basic definition of experience. Have you experienced so much for nothing? That would include suffering, but also the good experiences as a believer. The fellowship with God. The fellowship with like-minded believers. The spiritual maturity. The testing of your faith. The daily rigors of having to deal with the world. The challenges to do the right thing when confronted with so many things that oppose that. And then he says, if indeed it was for nothing, raising that question, was it really for nothing? Have you done all this? Have you experienced all this Christian life for nothing? Did you live by the Spirit for nothing? You see, this is a serious matter. They're breaking away from the gospel. They're breaking away from their call as Christians. And now Paul is addressing the issue of their breaking away from the power for the Christian life. Verse 5. we learn of some of those experiences. So then, does he who provides you the Spirit and works miracles among you, is it by works of the law or by the hearing of faith? Well, let's analyze this a little bit, then we'll come back to the interpretation. That's often the way we do this. So then, does he provide? Does he who provides you? The word for provide, epi, correct, geo, this is a word that basically means to supply. We translate it provide. If you were uh, a sponsor of some organization or some movement, you would supply their needs, perhaps the building, perhaps the, the pamphlets, the tables, the chairs, depending, of course, on what it is. But you're basically being supplied. 
So then does he who provides you the Spirit, he supplies you the Spirit, and works, let's look at that word, he's going to work miracles, energeo, you see the word energy, provides you the operation power, operational power, put forth power, it's a present active participle here. Does he who provides you the Spirit and the and who works miracles? Let's look at the word miracles. One we need to understand. It's a little uh, a little different. Dunamis. Basically, the word means power, might, strength, force. It includes power for miracles. I translated it miracles. Many do. But you've got to understand behind this is the idea of the power that you see, what you experience, what you get. All right? So dunamis means more than just miracles. Now let's go back and look at our verse again. So then, does he who provides you the Spirit and works miracles, including powers, uh, operates in your life, among you? Now let's talk about miracles for a moment. This was still in the day of miracles. People were still being healed. There were still prophecies. There were still uh, believers getting the word from God about particular situations. You still have your uh, sign gifts going on at this time. Uh, we see it both in Acts and within some of the earlier epistles that miracles were still going on. So they have witnessed miracles amongst them. Uh, tongues, the interpretation of tongues in their proper use. And then he raises the question again, is it by works of the law or by the hearing of faith? Now, if you see the power of the Spirit right in front of you, or you experience it in your life, and he asks you, did you get that by works of the law? Did that come from the law? Or by the hearing of faith? Now we can begin to see how far off people get. In simple terms today, we're saved by grace, but many people live by works. Not understanding the relationship between the two. And the works includes living in the power of the flesh. And let me just add this. If you do not know how to live by the power of the Spirit, you don't know how to live the Christian life. You've been playing at it. And it's frustrating, isn't it? You can't get your sin under control. You're really not growing spiritually. You're having trouble following a lot of this teaching. Well, you have to grow in the Word and the power of the Spirit. So Paul asked the same question. When you see these miracles among you, the one who provided you the Spirit, the one who works the miracles and the powers that you see around you in your life, in the life of your fellow brothers and sisters. Did you get that from the law? Same question that we saw back in verse 2. So Paul is just reasoning with them, laying this out for them, where you got all of this. The experiences that you've been having as believers came from the Spirit. Now, one of the assumptions that Paul has made with these believers that he's talking to, first of all, they're still believers. Secondly, they've had experiences with the Spirit in their lives. They've seen his miracles work. Lives changed. You know, we often have to just simplify things. I do this with the kids. We talk about the three action steps 
You receive the word. That means you hear it. You believe the word. And you apply the word. You have to go somewhere or listen to the Word of God taught accurately, of course. You have to believe it. You have to apply it. All of this is done in the power of the Holy Spirit. Now, in these first five verses that we've just looked at, Paul has addressed the Galatians with criticism and questions. You're being foolish. You're under spell. You're not making any sense. When's the last time you heard someone who's considered a great preacher or Bible teacher address his audience like that? Let alone the tone that Paul uses Paul's just being straightforward. He's being truthful to these people. They desperately need it. They're basically falling apart as Christians. Uh, many churches would never allow this kind of preacher or this kind of talk. Often it's because they need it so bad. Let me simplify this taking what we've seen. As believers, God has left us in this present evil world. At best, now listen, at best, people follow a law, they do works of the flesh. They live by the flesh. That's the best the world can come up with. That's produced in the present evil world. So you have lots of human good. You have some brand of morality. Of course, that's rapidly changing especially in American society. The Christian lives in a new age. He lives in the kingdom of God. We've discussed this, phase one. He lives by faith. He lives by hearing the word. He lives by the power of the Spirit. We have to choose. The Galatians were reverting back to the ways of the world, the ways of an unbeliever, the best that the unbeliever can produce. A false gospel of works, works added to the gospel, is a false gospel. And this is why they're still believers. They still have the Spirit. Even while God is still working miracles among them, they're going back to the old system. One of the great deceptions of legalism, now listen to this, one of the great deceptions of legalism, which is part of the package of the evil world is it makes people feel good. Feel good about what they're doing, how they are feeling. And this is perpetuated by the human good. Oh, you hear this comment when unbelievers do something sometimes in a television interview. Well, it just felt good to do it. Or the person comments, what a wonderful thing you're doing. 
It's improving the devil's world, which really can't be improved. This is the world of legalism. This is the world of grace. They are in total contrast. And something Paul's going to continue to work through with the Galatians. Let's pray. Oh, Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your spirit. And might we always live by your word and the power of your spirit to grow us to maturity that we might live a life honorable to Jesus Christ, walking in his footsteps. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.